chapter 10 through 12 of Daniel goes together. And it deals with Daniel's final vision, the final vision God gave to this man. And last week when we were together, we covered chapter 10, where we saw this amazing, intense battle taking place in the spiritual realm. And as we get into chapter 11, we find a, the correlating physical and earthly battle to this. Now, pay attention to this because I, I want you to know, I'm not going to teach the first 35 verses of chapter 11 to you. But I have written it down in a commentary for those of you who want to dig in and learn this passage of Scripture. And the reason why I'm doing this is because verses 1 through 35 is simply a history lesson about what was happening in the world after Alexander the Great died. And so there's just, there's not much in it that would be spiritually edifying or, or encouraging for you. And I doubt uh, you came to church simply for a history lesson. But it's still incredible. It's still fascinating. And I still encourage you to go along and, and open your Bible, go through the commentary that I've provided. Because this chunk of scripture, verses 1 through 35, contains one of the most detailed, precise, accurate prophecies in the entire Bible, no doubt, because Daniel predicts, he predicts world history over the course of 375 years with perfect accuracy. I mean, there are details in here. It's, it's just fascinating. And of course, Daniel written it before it happened. So we're able to look back and say, holy cow, like, man, when God says something, his promises and what he says will come to pass, it does come to pass. So Again, I've put it in commentary form if you want to read it. You can find this commentary in two places. You can find it on our church website. If you go to calvarycanyonhills.com, calvarycanyonhills.com, and go to the section where it says teaching, and you click teachings, and you just look on that page and you'll see commentary for Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 35. Click on it, and it's a simple word document that you can read. The other place you can find it is on the church's Facebook page. So our church Facebook page is Calvary Chapel Canyon Hills. And so you can go there and a link has been posted there for you as well. So I hope you enjoy that. So if you're excited to dig in, then say, let's dig in. Let me show you the three sections that are found in Daniel chapter 11. Section 1 in verses 1 through 20 deals with the trouble between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Section 2, verses 21 through 35, deals with the trouble between Israel and Antiochus Epiphanes. And then section 3, which is what I'm going to be teaching today, verses 36 through 45, deals with the trouble between the world and the Antichrist. Now, as we get into verse 36, there's a transition happening where in verses 21 through 35, Daniel is prophesying about a coming Greek ruler. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, we studied this man uh, earlier in the book of Daniel because he shows up earlier in the book of Daniel. And so he was this Greek ruler, a very nasty, nasty, wicked man who called himself a god. And he invaded Israel. He murdered a bunch of Jews. He defiled and desecrated the temple. And he did a lot of things that the Antichrist is going to do, but in more severe fashion, with just a whole, a lot more evil. And so God uses Antiochus Epiphanes to serve as a foreshadow and a precursor to the Antichrist. But last week, when we were in Daniel chapter 10, in verse 14, Daniel was actually told that this vision pertains directly to the latter days. And so there's a transition happening in the text. And so as we get into verses 36 through 45, it is now pointing more directly to the Antichrist and to the time of the end and, and specifically the period of time known as the seven-year Great Tribulation period. Remember that the Antichrist will rise into power after the church is raptured. 
The church will be snatched away quickly, suddenly, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, and Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. The church will be taken. And then Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says that the Antichrist is going to make a covenant that affects the whole world. And part of that covenant includes the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. He's going to rise up as a great world leader. He's going to bring unity to the planet. He's going to be hailed as a hero. And there will be a time of false peace and deception during the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. As we get into verse 36, it's speaking about what happens right in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. So we read Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 together. Then the king, the Antichrist, shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath of has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. So it says he's going to magnify himself above every god. And so this is correlating with an event we've talked about in previous studies, an event called the abomination of desolation, which marks the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. It says he will do according to his own will. He's going to do whatever he wants. And remember, This man is going to rise to power through what we call the revived Roman Empire, through a confederation of ten kings. But after the abomination of desolation takes place, he not only claims to be the only God of the universe, but he will also be reigning as king over a one world government, and the ten kings will give all their authority and all of their worship to him. It says here, he shall prosper Till the wrath has been accomplished. And this is speaking about God's wrath. Because during the second half of the tribulation period, God will be judging the world. The book of Revelation tells us, according to the seven trumpet judgments, followed by the seven bowl judgments. And then after God has finished pouring out his wrath, the Antichrist time will be accomplished or finished, as it says here in the verse. Now, I was thinking about it this week, and I'm like, man, we've referenced the seven-year tribulation period, the abomination of desolation, quite a bit. You can't help it as you're going through Daniel and looking at the book of Revelation. But it dawned on me, we've actually never covered Jesus' own teaching about the abomination of desolation. And I think we should probably do that. So we're going to turn right now to Matthew chapter 24. Keep your place in Daniel 11. We'll come back. But in Daniel chap- or, sorry, in Matthew chapter 24 and chapter 25, we have what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's the second longest sermon of Jesus in the Bible. The longest is the Sermon on the Mount, but the Olivet Discourse is the second longest sermon in the Bible, and it's Jesus' own teaching about eschatology and the end times and what's going to happen uh, in the near distant or the the near future for us, for sure. So we're going to start in verse 15, where Jesus actually mentions the abomination of desolation. It says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let, let him understand. It's like, tune up, pay attention. And so again, remember, the first three and a half years of the tribulation are marked by, by peace and a sense of false security. No one's fighting. There's no war. And, and then the abomination of desolation happens. And then the second three and a half years is just four of, it's full of wrath and death and billions of people, according to the numbers, will die. There won't be enough people on the planet to clean up the dead bodies. It's just going to be awful. And the abomination of desolation is what triggers the drastic change. In Hebrew, the word abomination means a detested idol. 
The word desolation means something that causes horror. So the detested idol, which is the Antichrist, causes God to be so horrified, his presence is absolutely desolate and gone from the temple there in Jerusalem. Now, if anyone is still confused about what the abomination of desolation actually is, here's a quick rundown. The Antichrist will walk into the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this temple has not yet been built, but Ezekiel prophesied about it. That's why it's called Ezekiel's Temple. The Temple Institute in Jerusalem can have it built in six months. They have all the material. I've seen with my own eyes standing in front of it the high priestly garments. They have everything. They have everything according to the the law of Moses, even the blue dye that comes from a rare form of snail. They did everything according to how it was done in the Old Testament, and they have it all. Six months, we will be making sacrifices on the Temple Mount, they say. And so the Antichrist, after three and a half years, goes in and he forces the Jews to stop making their sacrifices. He goes into the Temple, into the Holy of Holies, and there he claims to be the God of the universe, he then makes a law and legislates to the world and demands and forces everyone to worship him alone. He also sets up an image and he demands for the world to worship it. He makes the world take a mark on either their hand or their forehead. Revelation chapter 13 calls it the mark of the beast and it's represented by the number 666. All who do not worship him will be immediately executed. And at that point, God is so horrified, it's crossed the line where he begins to pour out his wrath from heaven for the next three and a half years. That's the abomination of desolation. In verse 15, Jesus, he he gives Daniel this hashtag shout out. Daniel, Daniel's the one who introduced this. Uh, is spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Daniel uh, mentions the abomination of desolation by name three times in the book of Daniel. So Jesus gives him a shout out. As we move on to verses 16 through 20, we see that the Jews uh, who see the abomination of desolation will flee to a place we call Petra. Look at verse 16. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So notice he's specifically talking to people living in Judea. That would be Israel, the Jews. And there's obviously this sense of urgency to leave. You know, don't go collect your belongings. Don't, just go. Get the heck out of town. And they flee to a place called Petra, which is located in modern-day Jordan, Israel's neighbor to the east. It's, it's south and a little east of the Dead Sea, just out in the middle of nowhere, basically. And the Jews who go there will be divinely protected by God. Revelation chapter 12 says that the Antichrist pursues them and tries to get them, but they're protected. Once they make it there, they're protected. And we find this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, when it says the woman who represents Israel flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, or in other words, three and a half years. Now, I'm going to talk a whole lot more about Petra and even show you some pictures a little bit later today. Verse 21 reveals the last three and a half years of this time of wrath. Jesus said, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So it's going to be more crazy and worse than the time when the Nephilim were roaming the earth, the days of Noah. It's going to be crazier, so crazy. There will never be another time before it or after it. And in verse 22, Jesus emphasizes again that the believing Jews will be divinely protected during this time. It says, unless those days were shortened, 
no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So one question arises from this verse. It's, why will the tribulation be such a short period of time? Because it's not like God to do things over the span of just a couple years. We see in the Bible God willing to fulfill his purposes over years and decades and centuries even sometimes. And it's like, man, you're going to do all this crazy. The Bible talks about this so much and it's only going to be three and a half years. And so the question, why it's such a short season of time, the answer is in verse 22. It says it's for the elect's sake. It's for these people's sake. Now, it's clear from this text that Israel... Not Gentile believers, but Israel is the elect here. Because in verse 16, he addresses people living in Judea. And then in verse 20, he talks to people who are celebrating and keeping Sabbath. Which we don't do. You know, it was an Old Testament law to take a 24-hour period from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. You don't work. You don't do yard work. You don't cook. You don't do any of that. That means nothing to us. You know, we, we do understand that, you know, Christ is our Sabbath. He's our rest. And we do enjoy times. I mean, we need days off from work. And we enjoy many Sabbaths. You know, when, when we're having a crazy day and we stop to pray for 10 minutes, that's, that's a little Sabbath there. But for the most part... You know, we're not keeping Sabbath. Today, to this day in Israel, even to a nominal Jew in Judaism, they are not working on that period of time. They are not cooking. They are keeping the law. They are not out. You you go out in the streets of Jerusalem and it's a ghost town because everyone's in their home celebrating, keeping Shabbat, Sabbath. So he's talking to the Jews. The Jews are the elect here. We are not mentioned here because we will be in heaven as the raptured church. Amen? Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 through 7 says, Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale? Alas, that day is great so that none is like it, It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved, preserved out of it. Now, in the book of Genesis, Jacob was one of the patriarchs. What did God change Jacob's name to? Israel. The tribulation is a time for Israel, not the church. The church will be raptured and we will be in heaven. Continuing, verses 23 through 25 says... Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or, or there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I, I've told you beforehand. And so the abomination of desolation ushers in the worst, worst time of deception and lies the world's ever seen. And then verses 26 through 27 says... Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. And so Jesus is saying, when I come back, it's not going to be private, like I'm hiding out in some secret room or out off in the desert. The real way Christ will make his physical return to the earth will be with a lot of power, glory, and drama. The nature of Jesus' second coming is not going to be private or reserved, but as plain as lightning that flashes across the sky. Now, we don't get very much lightning here in Southern California, but you go to some pockets and places and you see a real lightning storm, you cannot help but to be mesmerized by it. You sit there watching for it. You take your camera because you want a snapshot of it. It is full of power. It is full of majesty. And Jesus is like, man, when I show up, you're going to know it. You will know it. You will, you will not have to guess what's happening. The king is making his return. Amen? That's what's happening, and the world will know it. So that's what Jesus had to say about the abomination of desolation. Let's go back to Daniel Chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11.
We'll read verse 36 again. The king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. Now into verse 37. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. He won't regard the God of his fathers. So it's talking about him coming from a nationality. Now it's interesting because there are different words in the Bible for God. The word specifically used here is the word Elohim, which is the Jewish name for God. Because of this, many people believe the Antichrist could be from Jewish descent. We don't know that for sure, but to me, if it happens this way, it makes total sense because it's a greater, it's a greater way for Satan to attempt to hurt the heart of God. You know, Jesus came as the real Christ. Here's this one coming in place of Christ, and so why wouldn't he be of Jewish descent, you know? So that, that could be there. It also says here that he's not going to desire women. So he's not going to be attracted to women. Some scholars suggest this could mean he'll be homosexual, but that's not anything we know for sure. What we do know is he's just not going to dig chicks. <laughs> Verse 38 and 39. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses and a god which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things, Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Now, I think this is just simply speaking about how he becomes a man of war. He's obsessed with himself. He's advancing his his representative, which is Satan, who's empowering him. And, and it's just talking about how he, he's going to conquer and rule over people with, with force and evil and military weaponry. Verse 40 says, at the time of the end, everyone say the time of the end. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. So when it says at the time of the end, we now fast forward to the very end of the seven-year tribulation period. So right before Jesus makes the second coming, this is telling us that a variety of kings are going to try to come against the Antichrist, like they're fed up with them. Right, be, right before Jesus comes back at his second coming. But it says he will enter their countries and overwhelm them. So when they rebel against the Antichrist, he just simply invades, conquers them, and, and just mows over them. Verse 41 tells us, He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. So before Jesus comes back, the Antichrist makes Israel, the glorious land, his headquarters and base of operations. And as he's destroying all these people, God protects Israel's neighbor. The, the people of Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape from his hand. These ancient places are all located in the modern day country we call Jordan. You know, the capital of Jordan is Ammon. The, those were the Ammonites. Right before them were the Moabites. Right below them were the Edomites. And, and so he's saying these people will be protected. Now, this is significant because. After the abomination of desolation takes place, remember that the believing Jews escape. And do you remember where they flee to? They go to Petra. Petra is located in Jordan. So because Jordan harbors and receives these Jews, it seems like God's hand of protection will be on that nation. So we know in, in the end, Jordan's going to be one of the good guys. Pretty cool. 
verses 42 and 43 tell us, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So he, he's just on a rampage against anything and anyone who will not give him worship. And in the process, the Antichrist will have power over these African nations. Verse 44 says, but news from the east. Everyone say, news from the east. And the north will trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. The troubling news from the east is most likely connected to what we see happening in Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. John, having the vision, says, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates uh, was Babylon, modern-day Iraq. That's east of Israel. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million men. I heard the number of them. This stood out to John. To where he, I mean, in his day, a large army was like, like Alexander the Great had 35,000. You know, 100,000 men would be like, holy cow. And for him, 2,000 years ago to say, wait, come again? An army of 200 million men? He said, I, I heard it. I want you, I heard, the, I heard it. Now, to put this in perspective, in the United States, we have 329 million people living in this country. That's the 2019 most updated census. 329 million citizens. We're talking about a 200 million man army, an army alone. Now, is there a place anywhere in recent history where we see something talking about a 200 million man marching army? Well, I do have the answer to that question. Listen to this. Listen to this. In a 1961 edition of Time magazine, China boasted to the world that it now had a 200 million man marching army. Do you think that's coincidence? Or is God saying what he said he would? In the end times, Bible prophecy will become more clear. 1961. China didn't say 250, I'm not rounding. It wasn't 199, 205, exactly in that magazine, 200 million men. And so that's what it's talking about. The kings from the, you, go, you look on a map of Israel and you go east, you pass the river Euphrates and you get China. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So I, I think, you know, it's probably talking about some kind of spiritual barrier that, you know, this would have just never happened before God releases and dries up this barrier or something. And, and he's going to allow Israel to be invaded from the east like this. So I agree with many other Bible teachers that there will come a point when, when China just is finally fed up and is, is just done with the Antichrist and they begin to come make war with him and they begin advancing their army from the east towards Israel where the Antichrist will be located. Look at verse 44 again. News from the east and the north shall trouble him Therefore, he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. It also says kings from the north. Now, there's not really a, a, a correlating verse for this. We don't really know who this is. A lot of people suggest maybe Russia. Uh, we don't know. The main point is that at the very end of time, the world will be full of conflict and war 
culminating in all of the world's armies pointing, traveling, gathering together to make war against each other. And guess where? In the land of Israel the most important place on the planet. You know, I've been privileged to see some pretty cool places around the earth. And, you know, there, there's majestic places like, you know, the Alps in Switzerland. And, you know, there's, there's beautiful romantic places like the Venices and, and the Florences. But there's not a place on the planet that's more important than Israel. There is no place that's like it. There's, not, um, there's no place like I doubt Lucifer himself has knocked on my front door but you can bet he spent a lot of time in Israel. You know what I mean? That's what he's looking at. And that's where he makes his last stand. This is my, he's still fighting to the end against God. Verse 45 tells us, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Now, a great cross-reference that I want to plug into this that goes with this is Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. They gathered them together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. And Armageddon in Hebrew means the, the hill or city of Megiddo. There's an actual uh, ancient uh, city of Megiddo. There's ruins there. Um, and then there's the valley of Megiddo, you know, the breadbasket of Israel, this huge valley. And, and notice that it says the Antichrist will, will camp. He'll, he'll make his, his base of operations in between the seas, plural, and the glorious holy mountain. So let me show you with a map what this is actually talking about. To the Jew, when you say seas, their relationship to bodies of water are two places. The Mediterranean Sea, which is their border to the west, so all the blue water to the west, is one sea. The other sea would be the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake. And so you see that at the top there. Now, the Antichrist will be planted in between these two seas and the glorious, you know, the holy mountain, which would be Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So you see where Jerusalem is. So you can kind of make a triangle from the Mediterranean Sea to the Sea of Galilee to Israel. You make that triangle, and it says he will be in the middle of that. And you see the arrow right there pointing to the valley of Megiddo. Want to see some pictures? Okay, first picture. I am standing at the very top point of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is where the prophet Elijah, uh, all alone, basically prayer battled the prophets of Baal, and God sent fire down from heaven. I'm standing in the exact spot. It's, you know it's the exact spot because remember in the story, after that happened, he saw the ocean and prayed. There's only one place on Mount Carmel that you can stand that you can see the ocean. And it's at the very highest point. So I'm standing where fire came down from heaven. And the first time I was there, I was not leading or teaching a trip. I was just like sensory overload. And, and um, I, I'm hearing the story and I look behind me. And I'm like, holy junk, this is the Valley of Megiddo. Like, it was just, it, it stunned me. It was amazing. The Valley of Megiddo is right here. Now, I want you to notice something. Notice, uh, you know, in the distance, you see two airplane runways, kind of in the shape of a V. Can you kind of see that? That is an Israeli Air Force base, okay? That's where the Antichrist is going to be camped out. Right there. I, I was standing there on one of the trips one time, and I saw a hole open up in the ground, and all of a sudden a fighter jet came from up under the ground and made its way to the runway and took off, you know? And so there's a lot of technology. There's definitely nukes. You know, I ask my guide, Ike, I'm like, yeah, there's nukes there, honey. He's like, like, you have to ask, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. And so, boom. Uh, uh, the next picture. Um, do you see across the valley, do you see the little hilltop on the other side? That is Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. The Valley of Megiddo was like in his backyard his whole life growing up. And so you get these three incredible Bible stories. You, you get Mount Carmel, the Valley of Megiddo. You get Nazareth. Cana is just a little uh, to the left. Uh, you get the ancient capital of Jezreel. Maybe this would be a good time to plug in the fact that this week I locked in another Israel trip for our church. Yeah. 
you have a year and a half to save your pennies. It's going to be February of 2021, probably 11 to 12 day door-to-door trip. $3,500 covers everything. When I say everything, I mean everything. So if you start saving now, it's like $175 a month. Put away, put away. It'll change your life. It will change your life. It's one of the best things I can do to point you to Jesus and the word and, and just encourage you in being disciples of Jesus Christ. You're not in your head. You came with me. It's powerful. Phil, you've been there. Am I, am I, it will change your life. If you're planning to go on another vacation, it's just, it's just I, don't, I don't know what you're thinking, man. You got to get to Israel. It is awesome. So you got a year and a half. I've been six times. I know what I'm doing. It's a fantastic trip. I handpick my guide. He's the best of the best. I love him. So anyways, okay, one more picture. Uh, in this one, you can see I'm closer. I'm actually standing on the ruins of the city of Megiddo, and you can just look out. And there's, there's, it's, it's been a place of war since the time of the Egyptians. There was a great, great strategic battle there in World War I. Because of its location, its significance, it's, it's just always been a valley that has had many, 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 many wars. And at the end of time, the great war will take place right here. So verse 45 again, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. No one can help him because his battle is against Jesus. And speaking of the physical return of Jesus Christ, Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 verses 27 and 28, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and and, and glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, the significant thing about this passage of Scripture is in the context of Luke chapter 21, Jesus is talking about the Jews who are being preserved in Petra. They are the ones who will look up and see their Redeemer and their Savior coming to rescue them. So, when Jesus comes back to the earth, the first place he shows up to is Petra as a sign of redemption to his people who've been waiting for him. And from there, he begins to make his way to the valley of Megiddo. The Bible is actually specific about this. And so, I want you to turn... Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 63. This is an incredible prophecy, an incredible vision that Isaiah had. And basically what's going on is Isaiah receives a vision of the second coming. He sees Jesus, and as the second coming is taking place, he actually begins to have a conversation with Jesus. There's like a back and forth conversation in the vision. And so... Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom? Okay? Guess where Petra was located. The ancient kingdom of Edom. That's where Petra was like. Who's coming from? Who is this coming from Edom? Uh, With dyed garments from Basra. Basra is right there too. Basra means fortress. Um. This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. And and Jesus replies, his answer, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And Isaiah says, why is your apparel red? And your garments like one who treads in the winepress. Jesus says, I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. Now, when it says he treads the winepress alone, 
it means that he's the only one doing the fighting. Because we know, according to Revelation chapter 19 and other places, we, the raptured church, will be coming back with him. We are called the army of heaven, but we are not fighting. There's not a place in scripture that suggests we will do battle. We are just watching because vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he's just showing us, every time you question me about injustice, every time you wondered, let me show you my righteousness. Let me show you my justice now. And so we're watching. And we get a graphic picture that this war is likened to treading the wine press. This is, this is like rated R graphic stuff. Because back then, in order to press grapes to make wine or juice, whatever you're doing, you know, there's no technology. So they have these huge vats. And you basically pull up your garments and whatever you got and you wash your feet really good because if I'm going to be tasting that, you better... Wash those stinky feet, right? Clean feet. And you just get in and you start stomping. And you stomp and stomp. And they, it, it was a job for some people to stomp and stomp and stomp. And then the, the, the juice would, would flow out. And then all of the, the, the rest of the stuff, you know, was there. And you'd clean it out and then put some more grapes in. In this analogy that Jesus is telling us, each human being is likened to one grape. It's kind of gross. It's very graphic. He's treading the wine press, and there's death and blood. And he says, My robes are stained with blood. How ironic and sad is this? Their blood is covering and staining his robes because they refused to receive his sacrifice to allow his blood to cover and stain and wash them. Isn't that ironic? It's crazy. So, when Jesus first shows up, he shows up to Petra, and he begins making war from there. Let me show you some pics of Petra. The first one is, you know, you just, you're looking in this, there's an entrance in there somehow, and you, you just, you'd never know that there's like a huge city, and that a civilization, a whole people group lived in the midst of this. And the next picture um, it's just taken from a different angle. Um, you know, I'm standing on, on an ancient, it was called the, the Indian Silk Route. It was an ancient trade route. And, and people would walk by on this trade route and look at these rocks and never know there was people living in, in all the crevices and cracks. And so once you start to get in, next picture, um, oh, this is actually the back way. You see jeeps going to it. So it's just, it's protected. It's this huge, massive area, this rock fortress, and right in the middle of it is this city. Next picture. The reason why I showed this is because this is similar to a scene that you find in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Remember, he's on the horse, and he, he's riding through, and this is how you get there. And, and this is a, quite a long walk. You know, a lot of people, uh, I've only been there once, but a, a lot of the elderly people took the horseback, the buggy up. You know, it was, it was, it's a long walk. You just, you keep walking and it's narrow and you're just surrounded by these cliffs and it's, it's so fun, you know. And then eventually you're walking and, and you turn a corner and you see this. You see something and it's like, ooh. And, and then this space opens up. You can go to the next one. And this is the most recognizable uh, place of Petra. This is called the treasury and it's just huge and and this is just the beginning. Um, next picture, you can see the, the detail in, in the treasure. I think this was in one of the Transformers movies, too. Um, but you turn the corner, and there's just, I don't know how many. There's lots and lots of things like this. You know, it's not just this. And it, it eventually opens up, and you see all these shrines and temples and places where people used to live. There's a huge amphitheater that was just carved from the rock. Everything was carved out from the rock. So Jesus returns. He goes to Petra first. And from here he begins to tread the wine press. Revelation chapter 14, verse 20 tells us the wine press was trampled outside the city, which means Jesus is not fighting in Jerusalem. That's the city. The wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press. Up to the horse's bridles, that's about my height, that's a lot of blood, that's a river of blood, 
And the length of this river of blood extended for 1,600 furlongs. Now, I, I doubt any of you use this measurement today. If you do, let me know. You're a very curious person. 1,600 furlongs for us means 200 miles. 200 miles. So the blood stretched for 200 miles. Now, just take a guess. T just take a random guess. How many miles do you think it is between Petra and the Valley of Megiddo? Yeah. It's 200 miles. Whew. And the culmination, we're told, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 19 through 20 says, I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, that's you and me. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. As we just read in Daniel chapter 11, verse 45, he shall come to his end and nobody will help him. And you and I get a front row seat. Better than any IMAX you've seen. Uh, we'll guarantee that. And so Satan's strategy is he wants China to come. He wants all these nations to come because he's actually making a last-ditch effort to fight against Jesus, and all of these armies, missiles, and weapons will be pointed against Jesus. You can actually read in the book of Joel, it's an account of us returning with Jesus, and it talks about us like dodging missiles. Like, they don't hit, obviously, but it's, it's really incredible. We're never seen as fighting, but we're there watching. And we see Jesus conquer. And after the Valley of Megiddo, do you know what Jesus does? It's beautiful. He makes his return to Jerusalem. And Zechariah, I believe it's chapter 14, tells us Jesus will touch down on the Mount of Olives at the exact place where the disciples saw him ascend to heaven, where the angel said the same way you saw him come, leave, he will come back. And he goes to the Mount of Olives, and it splits in half. Amazing, because right in the middle of the Mount of Olives, there's a big fault line. You can see it from the Temple Mount. And Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives. And this is so special because the Mount of Olives was Jesus' favorite place to be when he was in Jerusalem. Because that's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. That was his place of prayer. Do you know why he picked this place of prayer? Do you know why when he was trying to muster up the courage and the willpower to surrender to the, the Father's will of the cross as he's sweating drops of blood, he wasn't going to do that anywhere else. He needed to be in the Garden of Gethsemane to do that. Because he, just like you, will have times where it's confusing and it's hard and you're going to need to stand on the promises of the word of God and you're going to have to strengthen yourself and the Lord. You're going to have to speak and preach to yourself the promises of God. Jesus goes to his place of future victory. One day, I will be back here and I will be coming to set up my kingdom. And I will be coming to reign. And I will be coming to get rid of the deception on earth. And I will be coming to bring peace to the earth the way it was meant to be back in the Garden of Eden. And he's there in the garden just strengthening himself, encouraging himself. This is the place of my victory. This is where it is. And you and I have to do that as well. From that point, when Jesus steps and touches down on earth, he ushers in his eternal kingdom. And the kingdom of God is something I want you to ponder this morning. Because when Jesus showed up, his message, do you remember what he said every time when he first started showing up? The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is drawn near. You see, Jesus' first and second coming is an invasion of a kingdom to fight and come against the forces of darkness on this world. 
And I want you to understand, every decision you make, every thought you pursue is a kingdom issue. You might not think of life this way, but I want to help you. I can, you can reduce life to two simple things. To, 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 to just two simple things. You're, you're either making decisions for Christ's kingdom or another kingdom. And there's no in between. You know, and it could be your own kingdom. It could be someone else's kingdom. You know, working, working, striving, striving to build up someone else's kingdom on earth. That doesn't sound fun. But to build up treasures, to work so hard, to lose sleep, to not be around your family, to, to store things that will not be enjoyed in heaven, that you're only going to get for a couple years, it's going to break down. It's all going to burn. The house, the bank account, the lofty things people think of you, that is not going to matter. When Michael Jordan shows up in heaven, is like, look at Jesus and be like, I'm not impressed. <laughs> What'd you do with me, homie? You know what I mean? The Bill Gates, the, oh, it doesn't matter. And I just want to point you to refocus and recalibrate your life that every decision you make and the pursuit of your life and the direction of your life would be for the only kingdom that's going to last. Jesus said, it's okay for you to do things for my kingdom to, to store up for yourselves treasures that you will be able to last for eternity. Do that instead of wasting your time building up your own kingdom on earth. The kingdom of heaven is an invasion. And you know what? It's seeking to invade your heart, your spirit, and your mind, and my mind, and my heart as I speak. Jesus is wanting to draw the battle lines forward. He wants to take more ground in us. More ground in this church. But we got to give up the pursuits of other kingdoms. we got to forsake those things. And I want you to count the cost this morning to know those things don't matter. And yes, God wants you to enjoy things. And if you make a lot of money, great, enjoy it. Just make sure the money don't got you. Pursue, make decisions, make deposits, make investments, make sacrifices towards the only kingdom that's going to last. Because when we see the ushering in of his kingdom, you know what I'm going to be thinking at that moment? I'm going to look at you and I'm going to be like, dude, like, I really hope we invested in the kingdom right now, you know? Because we're going to find out at the Bema judgment what we did on this earth. Only what's done for Christ will last. This morning, I just feel from the Lord like encouraging you and challenging you to make a recommitment of your life to the kingdom of heaven, to be a kingdom citizen before any other citizenship you have, to be a part of Jesus' culture before any family culture you come from, to be a part of his work before any work you do for your job, and to prioritize him. And so as Phil comes to lead us in worship again, if, if you're with me at that, and if this is resonating with you, I think we should make a stand, like a literal stand. If you want the kingdom of heaven to invade you more, if you want to make decisions that are more towards the kingdom of Christ, would you stand with me? Just as a, a sign, as a, as a something to show God, I'm with you, I'm with this, I'm recalibrating, I'm rethinking my life. It's good for us to rethink life every now and again. And so think of where you're at and think of what God has put in your heart, the gifts, the promises of the past, the things he stirred you up for, and go for those things. <laughs>